June 10th, 1998. He may have backed the bombers who attacked the World Trade Center. Weapons which he supplied shot down U.S. helicopters in Somalia. He applauded the bombings of U.S. bases in Saudi Arabia. American forces have now gone to a higher level of alert because he's threatened new attacks on U.S. targets. We believe that the biggest thieves in the world are Americans, and the biggest terrorists on Earth are the Americans. Tonight, he's rich, well-educated, and by his own description, one of America's most dangerous enemies. From ABC News, this is Nightline, reporting from Washington. Ted Koppel. He has a personal fortune estimated at $250 million. His family, which has publicly renounced any connection with him, is nevertheless believed to be a continuing resource. Their worth is said to be in the neighborhood of $5 billion. He lives in a cave atop a range of mountains in Afghanistan. From there, he controls a web of financial, logistical, and strategic assistance to Sunni Islamic groups engaged in what they consider a jihad, or a holy war. The principal targets of that jihad are the Israelis and the United States. His name is Osama bin Laden, and you will meet him a little later in this program. He does nothing to undermine the profile of himself as a terrorist leader with global influence. Indeed, he seems to take considerable satisfaction in it, even though the profile has been drawn by U.S. intelligence agencies. Washington does, in fact, take him and the threat he poses seriously. Some intelligence sources claim that Osama bin Laden was connected to the bombing of the World Trade Center in New York and the bombing of Kobar Towers in Dahran, Saudi Arabia, two years ago on June 25th. Bin Laden described that particular terrorist act as, quote, the beginning of war between Muslims and the United States. Here's our national security correspondent, John McQuethy. Kobar Towers was a turning point for the United States. Nineteen American servicemen came home in coffins. Within the military, there were two frightening realizations that it could have been much worse and almost certainly would happen again. In Saudi Arabia, once considered relatively safe for Americans, the landscape changed overnight says General Hugh Shelton, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. It directed our attention and made us look at what are we not doing that we should be doing. The biggest single change since then was for the U.S. to simply move its biggest operation, to sweep up thousands of people in uniform, working and living in hundreds of scattered buildings around Dahran, and to relocate them out in the middle of the desert at Prince Sultan Air Base. There would be no more mixing of U.S. servicemen with Saudi citizens, no more open parking lots next to key buildings. American troops would simply stay inside the vast barbed wire enclosure, protected and isolated. By putting everybody down there in that remote region, it's a, it's a, a vast area. They're able to maintain very, very good security. Wayne Downing is the retired four-star general who led the Pentagon's initial investigation of the Kobar Towers bombing. You know, the weakness of that setup is, is we put all of our eggs in one basket. Uh, there's probably no greater target now for uh, some type of a, uh, say, a missile or an airstrike attack than Prince Sultan Air Base. But successfully combating terrorism is usually accomplished with the little things, the details. At every facility in Saudi Arabia now, outer security fences are hundreds of feet away from the nearest buildings. That means a truck bomb, to be effective, must get inside the fence. How you doing? Can you shut your vehicle off? We're basically looking for any type of uh, wires that might be out of place. It doesn't look like they need, they're supposed to be there. Uh, any type of explosive device. Um, we check the battery real well, real well to uh, make sure that there's no extra wires coming from the battery. 
Tightening security at the gate is relatively easy, but getting individual commanders to understand the complexities of protection can still be a problem. Each one of the services has been allowed to go off in its own direction and kind of choose those solutions which they think are appropriate. And the problem is many times they don't know what is appropriate. Another challenge is a constantly changing threat. What we have to watch for now is also chemical and biological uh, threats that could be directed against us. And uh, in that area, we, we paid a lot of attention, but we've still got a ways to go. American troops in the Gulf are all getting shots to protect them from anthrax, one of the easiest biological weapons to concoct. And every facility is getting improved detectors for biological and chemical weapons. Intelligence gathering has also intensified, as has the effort to get information to commanders quickly. A sometimes difficult relationship with the Saudis becomes even tougher on certain types of intelligence. They have yet to come clean with the U.S. on who they believe conducted the Kobar Towers bombing and who trained them. It came as a bit of a shock to the Saudis to find out how many Saudi young men had been trained overseas by the so-called Afghani in extremist or potential terrorist roles. Further tensions were created by the way the FBI handled itself in Saudi Arabia. In the view of the Saudis, the FBI tried to muscle them. The Saudis simply stopped talking. The image of the FBI is a forensic bull in an Arab China shop, and a bull that can't speak the language and doesn't understand the culture. Of course, the U.S. military creates its own problems. Few service people speak Arabic. Even commanders rarely stay in the region longer than a year or two, scarcely enough time to cultivate relationships with their counterparts. And the U.S. presence is huge, more than 31,000 in the Gulf today. We are a big target as a superpower, as, a, uh, as an eminent power in the region that we operate in. This is a risk that we take as we operate around the world. You know you're going to be a target as the world's last remaining superpower. I think the, uh, the, the uh, answer is uh, it's not if, it's when. But the U.S. is spending millions to make it harder to strike. Make it extremely difficult for the terrorist so that he will give up on you and go seek a target uh, which is easier for them. For the U.S. military, this is all intended to send a message. It's aimed, at least in part, at sponsors of terrorism, ranging from Osama bin Laden to some leaders in Iran. But it is also meant to be heard by America's friends in the Gulf. We're not a country that's to be run off just because some individual or group decide that they want to come after the United States. So the U.S. is staying. You can keep trying, but the U.S. is staying. The U.S. is, is here to stay. But staying in the Gulf is very difficult for the United States. It costs billions of dollars to operate, and this is a part of the world where the threat is very real. Ted? John, there'll be some other issues that uh, will be coming up in our next report, and I wonder if you could stay around and we'll talk about some of those in a moment. There is an immediate reason for the high level of security that John McCarthy reported on when we come back. A close look at the most dangerous man you've never heard of. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Royal Caribbean. Several weeks ago, the Saudi businessman turned terrorist Osama bin Laden issued a new threat against Americans, a threat taken so seriously that the Departments of State and Defense have ordered security tightened at embassies and U.S. bases throughout the Middle East and Persian Gulf. ABC's John Miller recently traveled to Afghanistan for a rare interview with bin Laden. Osama bin Laden is well hidden and heavily guarded by his own cadre of trained Muslim fighters. Moving between a series of camps in the Afghan mountains, he has issued a series of fatwas, religious decrees signed by Muslim clerics that call for military jihad, holy war, against the United States. We believe that the biggest thieves in the world are Americans, and the biggest terrorists on earth are the Americans. The only way for us to fend off these assaults is by using similar means. We do not differentiate between those dressed in military uniforms and civilians. They're all targets in this fatwa. 
Bin Laden made his latest threats during our interview, but then just days later he issued a new fatwa, promising more violence if U.S. troops are not removed from Saudi Arabia. You will leave when the bodies of American soldiers and civilians are sent in the wooden boxes and coffins. That is when you will leave. It may be easy to make such threats. A man on a hilltop backed by a few hundred Mujahideen soldiers declaring war on the United States. But it's not a conventional war that he's threatening. Bin Laden is talking about terrorism. Osama bin Laden um, may be the most uh, dangerous non-state uh, terrorist in the world. Um, and uh, we certainly have discussed this with the Saudis. We will take every, every precaution that we can. Uh, this is a man who has a demonstrated capacity and, and, and will to carry out acts of terrorism, and we take this seriously. To find bin Laden, we had to travel to Pakistan, where eventually bin Laden's people made contact. We moved north through dusty towns to the Afghan border. Just before sunset, bin Laden's people led us on foot through the mountains, and we crossed unseen into Afghanistan. Two days later, at one in the morning, we met with bin Laden. Clearly, for our benefit, there was a little show of gunfire by his men to greet him. Vince Canestrero is a former CIA official and an ABC News consultant on terrorism and security matters. Clearly, he is a role model for a lot of Islamic militants in the world today. I mean, his personal story is so compelling to them. Bin Laden left his home in Saudi Arabia at the age of 19 to join the Muslims fighting the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Like many of the young fighters, he was religious and committed. Unlike any other, he came from a Saudi family that ran a construction empire worth $5 billion. Bin Laden's personal worth is estimated at $200 million. Yet he sacrifices all of that to take up what he believes is a religious duty, an obligation to expel the atheistic invaders of a, of a Muslim country. We must use punishment to keep your evil away from Muslims, Muslim women and children. To understand bin Laden's hatred for America, you have to put the U.S. in a context it is seen by many Muslims. Americans impose themselves on everyone who believes in his religion and his rights. They accuse our children in Palestine of being terrorists, those children who have no weapons and have not yet even reached maturity. We asked bin Laden about Somalia. The United States referred to the military operation in Somalia as a rescue mission to prevent genocide by warring tribes. But bin Laden simply viewed it as another invasion of an Islamic country. American intelligence agencies believe it was bin Laden who dispatched his personal brigades with rocket launchers to shoot down U.S. helicopters. Eighteen U.S. soldiers were killed. Bin Laden does not deny he had a role and revels in America's retreat from Somalia. Our people realize more than before that the American soldier is a paper tiger that ran in defeat after a few blows. America forgot all about the hoopla and media propaganda and left dragging their corpses and their shameful defeat. And in Saudi Arabia, another kind of warfare. In November 1995, a bomb exploded at the Saudi National Guard training center in Riyadh, killing five Americans. The bombers made videotape confessions saying they were inspired by bin Laden. We look at these young men as great heroes and martyrs who followed the steps of the Prophet. Peace be upon him. We called and they answered. Now investigators believe bin Laden's attacks, or at least his alleged financing of attacks on Americans, may have struck a lot closer to home. The FBI believes bank accounts controlled by bin Laden may have funneled money to Ramzi Youssef to blow up the World Trade Center. When Youssef was captured in February of 1995, he was staying at a guest house, paid for by bin Laden. Ramzi Youssef. Ramzi Youssef, after the World Trade Center bombing, became a well-known Muslim personality. And all Muslims know him. Unfortunately, I did not know him before the incident. America will see many young men that will follow Ramzi Youssef. It is precisely what bin Laden can do for the other Ramzi Yousefs that American authorities are worried about. The U.S. Justice Department believes bin Laden is operating what is, in essence, an underground foundation where terrorists can apply for a grant.
From this New York courthouse, a federal grand jury is currently probing whether or not bin Laden has been financing terrorist attacks around the world. And the FBI has a new witness who may be able to shed a lot of light on that investigation. A man who is said to be a key aide in bin Laden's terrorist operations. The new witness's name is Wally Khan. He was convicted, along with Ramsey Yosef, of plotting to blow up U.S. airliners over the Pacific. Now, ABC News has learned Khan is cooperating with the FBI. He's told them that he was a key operative for bin Laden's terrorist network. And bin Laden makes no bones about knowing Khan. Wally Khan. Wally Khan is a Muslim youth. In Afghanistan, he was nicknamed the Lion. He is one of the best. We were good friends. We fought in the same trenches against the Russians. Khan said he was dispatched to Manila by bin Laden to launch terrorist operations, including plans to assassinate the Pope and President Clinton. Bin Laden says he didn't order the attempt on either man, but also said he wasn't surprised about plans to kill President Clinton. Bin Laden has issued these fatwas and made these threats before, but this time there's something different. He put a time cap on it, saying that whatever action will be taken against Americans in the Gulf, whatever violence awaits, will occur within the next few weeks. Ted? John, thanks very much. Let me also ask you to stand by now, and when we come back, a conversation with ABC's John Miller and John McQuethy. Joining us now from the Pentagon is ABC's national security correspondent, John McQuethy, and from New York, ABC's John Miller. John Miller, you've done something that no U.S. intelligence analyst, I gather, has done, and that is you've not only eyeballed the man, but you've seen his mountain redoubt, his headquarters. What is there about the man or the circumstances or the surroundings that leads you to take him seriously? Well, he does have a large force. Uh, we spent a lot of time waiting to see him, which gave us a chance to uh, really sit around and talk with bin Laden's soldiers. They talked in great deal about the battles in Afghanistan, in Somalia, and other places where they fought, and, uh, and their level of commitment to him. They regard him uh, as almost a god. John McQuethy, I, I know that you have serious doubts about his connection with the bombing at Kobar Towers. Is there any reason to believe that we should take any of the other claims by him or about him any more seriously? I think the U.S. government and the intelligence community in particular takes him very seriously. Uh, there are some of his fingerprints, as John has indicated in his story, uh, in some other very violent affairs uh, throughout the region and in Africa. Uh, so the U.S. has no doubt that this is a man that can fund very nasty operations and who is dedicated to directing them at the United States. How sophisticated, John Miller, a man, how sophisticated do you think he is in terms of being able to adjust his tactics? I was alarmed, for example, uh, by something in John McQuethy's report in which uh, one of the military people said, yes, I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of well protected against a car bomb attack. We might not be as well protected against a rocket attack. Uh, how sensitive do you think he is, bin Laden? Uh, to, to different devices, different approaches, different tactics. I think he's very sensitive to that. Uh, he has his own satellite uh, time that he rents and does his own TV broadcast to his followers, and that way he's high-tech. But basically, terrorism by its nature, uh, conventional terrorism, is a very low-tech business. Uh, the World Trade Center and uh, some of the other plots we've seen showed you didn't really need a lot of equipment or even know-how to put these projects together. And I think he relies on that. It allows him to, fa to fund many of these projects without um, putting out a great deal of money for uh, any single one. We're two weeks away, uh, John McQuethy, from the Cobar Tower anniversary. Um, are anniversaries taken seriously in the intelligence community? In other words, is, is that something that gives them to, to, to hang... Uh, their fears on at this particular moment? It's often an excuse for groups, terrorist groups, to do things uh, that are to the detriment of the United States. They take the anniversaries seriously because they have seen in the past that there have been strikes on the anniversaries. There have also been some indications that American facilities throughout the Persian Gulf region in particular have again had surveillance outside them. Curious cars with unusual license plates pausing, trying to monitor activities of American citizens. Is bin Laden, John Miller, a function simply of the enormous amount of money that he has and that his family has, or does he really have an army? 
Well, he has, it's been reported, 3,000 people. Now, that's not 3,000 people in that camp next to him. He has several hundred, or at least what it appeared to us to be several hundred, with him in those training camps. But he's also sought to open and fund training camps in the Philippines and other places to do a two-stage program, religious indoctrination into Muslim fundamentalism, and then uh, military training to uh, serve in his various armies. And that soft number, 3,000, is what the intelligence community is kicking around. John McCarthy, let me end on, on what may be the most obvious question here, and that is, if the U.S. government takes him that seriously as a threat, has any thought been given to taking proactive uh, measures against him? I think if the United States thought that they could extend in a legal way under our law uh, an ability to go after him and to apprehend him and bring him back to the United States, they would do so, and I would not be at all surprised uh, if they are not looking for ways to try that. John Miller, is he expecting that, do you think? I think one of the keys to that is that they are running a grand jury out of New York. They are seeking an indictment, and that indictment in many ways is just a piece of paper, but I think it'll be the device that they use, uh, much in the way that they use one to go after Noriega, to try and find a way to target bin Laden and, and capture him if the time is right and it's possible. John Miller, John McCarthy, thank you both very much. I'll be back in a moment. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, a look at racial diversity on the staffs of our Supreme Court justices. That's Good Morning America tomorrow. And that's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good. If you'd like a transcript or video cassette of this or any other edition of Nightline, please dial 1-800-CALL-ABC. Nightline is always on with abcnews.com, on the web or AOL. Nightline has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. ABC News, now always on. ABCnews.com, the first place for news online. Get your news first from ABCnews.com, on the web, and America Online.